Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to everyone, guests and members, and those joining us by live stream. We uh, are thankful that you could join us. There are no additional announcements from this morning, so we uh, hereby welcome our own Pastor Rolf to the pulpit once more, and pray that he will be strengthened for his task and we can receive it well. Good afternoon. Out of reverence for the Lord, let's begin together while standing. <clears throat> Our call to worship this afternoon is from Psalm 103, verse 13, and then verse 22. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. And the reason or the response then ought to be this, as the end of the psalm says, bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless him then for his compassion. That is our call this afternoon. We respond to this call to worship in unison with the confession that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Receive also the greeting of our God, grace to you and peace from Him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before His throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let's also join together in a hymn of praise about this comfort, this compassion of our God. The words of hymn 15 will sing all stanzas.
Here in Living Light, as we've been in the afternoon working through the doctrine of salvation, summarized in the Heidelberg Catechism, we've come to Lord's Day 20. Lord's Day 20 begins a, a new section in the Heidelberg Catechism, as in Lord's Days 9 all the way through 24, we're ex- expounding on what the Apostles' Creed is summarizing as the Christian faith. We're now at the third section, Lord's Day 20, God the Holy Spirit in our sanctification. Uh, Lord's Day 20 uh, will teach us who the Spirit is and, and what God has given us the Spirit for. In connection with that, I would like to read with you from 2 Corinthians again. We read from that chapter or that letter this morning. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to read from chapter 1 and then also from chapter 7, picking up in Lord's Day 20 on the theme of comfort. The Holy Spirit is given to me to comfort me, Lord's Day 20 says. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul opens this beautiful letter with reminding us of who God is as the God of all comfort. That also comes back again in chapter 7. So that's why I've selected those two readings. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3 through 11 to start. And you'll notice immediately how emphatic that topic of comfort is in the opening verses. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. We will jump a little bit further in this letter to chapter 7, verses 2 through 16. Again, Paul speaks of his comfort here. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. Besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For whatever boasts I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. 
But just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. And his affection for you is even greater, as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice, because I have complete confidence in you. And you can hear there again, as I said, much on the theme of comfort. Uh, Paul is especially the one in the New Testament who writes of these comforts, and it's especially this letter where that's drawn out, and the Lord willing, we can understand that more deeply as we open later. Let's also, in preparation for the message, sing together from Psalm 109. The psalmist in Psalm 109, verses 9 and 13, is also uh, singing of this God of comfort and the comfort and compassion he experiences from God. We'll sing Psalm 109, verses 9 and 13. We just saying he stands beside all those who suffer his help and comfort he will offer. And that element of he stands beside all those who suffer uh, is also going to come back. So just wanted to highlight that. Let's also turn together to the Apostles' Creed. Uh, sorry, yeah, well, I guess it is the Apostles' Creed, but the Heidelberg Catechism's explanation of the Apostles' Creed in Lord's Day 20. As is our custom here, in Living Light, I will ask the question and invite you to recite the answer together as it appears on the screen. What do you believe concerning the Holy Spirit? First, He is together with the Father and the Son, true and eternal God. Second, He is also given to me to make me by true faith share in Christ and all His benefits, to comfort me and to remain with me forever. Afterwards, as our Amen, we'll sing together uh, the words of hymn 64, which is uh, Lord's Day 1, put to verse. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the book of comfort, that is, the common nickname for the Heidelberg Catechism, the Book of Comfort. It comes in part from the opening question and answer, which is what we'll sing in, Lord's Day, in, in hymn 64, what is your only comfort in life and in death? It's a famous question and answer. It's loved by millions. And what starts in Lord's Day 1 with that first question and answer is then carried as a theme throughout the Heidelberg Catechism. It's not every Lord's Day, but it pops up periodically throughout the Lord's Days, 
And even if it's not specifically mentioned, it's there sometimes in the word benefit and the question, what does it benefit you? What does it benefit you? What does it comfort you? It's, it's similar. Well, Lord's Day 20 this afternoon mentions it specifically again. It's in the middle of a bit of an emphasis in the last, or, or in this section of the catechism, the question and answer before 52, what comfort is it to you that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead? It's going to come back again in question and answers uh, 57 and 58 in Lord's Day 22. What comfort does the resurrection of the body offer you? What comfort do you receive from the article about the life everlasting? And so suddenly this theme is brought to the surface very much again. Comfort. Lord's Day 20, we just recited, says the Holy Spirit is also given to me to comfort me. And that's what we're going to think about this afternoon. And who doesn't need comfort in this world? Here is another one of God's indescribable gifts. And so the theme is simple this afternoon, the Holy Spirit comforts me. We'll see how that's deep comfort, only comfort, and personal comfort. The Holy Spirit comforts me. First of all, deep comfort. How often do you hear the word comfort and not actually think about what it really means? I dare say that in today's world, the word comfort has lost a lot of its depth. What do you think of when you hear the word comfort? I learned this week that the majority of millennials, that's people my age and a bit younger, they plan to retire when they're 60. Don't worry, I'm not thinking like that. They figure that they'll need about $1.65 $1.65 million to retire comfortably. That jumped out at me as I was listening because I was busy with this topic of comfort. What does it mean to retire comfortably? What's their definition of comfortably? When people think today of comfort, they might typically think of comfortable homes. Easy chairs, vacations, and rest. Or there's comfort that we typically connect with the word cozy. If you're looking for a hotel to stay on on your trip this summer, you might stay at the Comfort Inn. You could sit at a pool at some resort and sip on a cocktail of Southern Comfort. If you've got little on the agenda for the day and that's going to allow you to stay at home for the day, maybe you're going to put on some comfy clothes. If it's been a hard day, maybe you settle down in the, into the couch and, and you get comfortable with some of your favorite comfort food. After a long day, you might crawl into your bed at night and pull the comforter up close. Some market observers, as I was reading this week, are suggesting that that's actually even more and more on the upswing. In a chaotic world, consumed by one crisis after another, it seems people just want to feel safe and cozy and comfortable. And so marketers and commercial, and in commercials and advertisements, even for things like alcohol and handbags and, and clothing, they all suggest this theme of comfort. Says one author I was reading, many in our culture worship at the cult of comfort in a self-centered search for ease, end of quote. Or think about the world of the the field of medicine. We talked there too about keeping people comfortable. And we're grateful to God for the things that doctors and nurses and caregivers are able to do to accomplish that in hospitals, in hospices, when people are very sick, when they're suffering, when they're dying, and there can be a lot of pain in that. We, We receive that blessing, the ability to keep people comfortable. How does all of that translate into this, though? Here's the temptation that we face. Keeping someone comfortable in a hospital, for example, usually involves special kinds of medications, steroids or painkillers. Is the catechism here talking about some kind of spiritual sedative that helps you to calm down and to find peace and rest? Is this comfort a spiritual painkiller? Is the Spirit given to me to numb me to some of this suffering? 
and the groaning so that life is just made a little bit easier? What is this comfort that He gives me? I think you'll agree with me that some of or most of what I've described for you so far is a kind of superficial comfort. It deals with surface things, with symptoms rather than dealing with what's at the heart. You can go ahead and enjoy some comfort food after a long day, but what does it really help in the long run? You could feel cozy in your comforter for a night, but you'll still have to get up in the morning. What's going to get deeper? What does the word comfort really mean? It seems to have gone soft in our language today. Now, it can help even to just think about the English word. I know we're done catechism for the year, but the catechism students know that by now, if that's the way I start talking, I'm going to pull out the whiteboard and write the word comfort on there and start breaking it into pieces. And I'm going to do that this afternoon, but without the whiteboard. They would have to guess what language the word comfort comes from. And in this case, it's, the word, it's from Latin, and it's the word comfortera. That's the verb. And that word in Latin comes from two Latin words, com and fortis. Now, you probably know, actually, the basic meaning of both of those Latin words. Calm is a preposition that we also use in English. It means with or together. Think of the word communion, which is going to come back in Lord's Day 21, the communion of saints. Communion, that is a, a real intense togetherness. And then there's that word fortis. If someone has a particular forte, that's a strength of theirs. Calm fort with strength. So at its root, comfort doesn't really have anything to do with ease and coziness, but with strength and fortitude and courage. That's what Paul is writing about too in the passages which we read. He's, he's not thinking about this almost sleepy kind of contentment. It's not a tranquilizer of grace that dulls the pain it's a stiffening agent. It fortifies and strengthens someone in heart and soul and mind. Comfort relates to encouragement and help. Help that is typically drawn from or experienced together with someone else. Someone's at your side. See, more than going to Latin, we should go to Paul's word for comfort. Maybe some of you remember the old hymn 49 in the book of praise, 1984. Then it was hymn 38 in our old book of praise. Stanza 1 was the memory work for grade 2 this past week. But stanza 3 says this in the old 1984 edition. The Spirit, knowing all our needs, perfects our prayers and intercedes as paraclete before God's throne, our cause He makes His very own. Well, that language was updated in our edition today, probably because we don't really know what the word paraclete means. But it's that word that Paul uses when he speaks about comfort. Its root meaning is to call to one side. Now, why might you call someone to your side? We say there's strength in numbers. If you have to face something alone, it's usually harder than facing the things together. Paraclete, to call to one's side. It's like in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 6, which we read, but God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus, called to one's side. And that continues, and not only by His coming, but also by the comfort with which He was comforted by you. As He told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. Again, they were at each other's side. Strengthened and encouraged by having one at your side then the affliction and the trouble isn't removed or even numbed for a time. It's worked through together. Jesus is the paraclete in 1 John 2 verse 1. 
If anyone does sin, John writes there, we have an advocate, a paraclete, Jesus Christ the righteous. He comes to our side in our struggle with sin to speak up in our defense. When Jesus is preparing His disciples for His death and His resurrection and His coming ascension, He promises them another helper, or alternately translated another counselor or another comforter, but it's all for that word paraclete, John 15, 26. He doesn't just come to our side then. No, Jesus says not only will He be with you, but in you. In you, not just to be a spiritual painkiller, a numbing agent so that the misery and the brokenness of this world doesn't touch you as painfully. No, He's there to give you strength and courage and fortitude to steal your heart, not by removing the afflictions and the pains, but providing for you in the middle of them. Like Paul says in what we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. In all our affliction. Not comforts us by numbing those afflictions or even removing those afflictions or giving us some sense of ease during those afflictions, but in being present there, at our side, in our hearts, in our affliction, to provide that courage and that strength and that fortitude to endure that affliction, to bear up under it, and to glorify God in the middle of it. That's far deeper, isn't it, than the ease and coziness and sleepiness almost that is associated with the word comfort today. There's the danger that comfort is merely an escapism, an avoidance of the pain and suffering, but this goes so much deeper. Because who can really avoid the suffering and pain? Paul says it very clearly in Romans 8. He exhausts his vocabulary almost of expressions. This creation is groaning. It's in bondage to corruption. It's subject to decay. It's in the pains of childbirth. And you don't need me to describe for you how that's true. We all feel it in different ways. We suffer. And we don't need a spiritual painkiller to numb all of that. We need strength and courage and fortitude so that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Hope that doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts by His Holy Spirit whom He has given us. Romans 5, 3 to 5. The Holy Spirit, whom, as we confess in Lord's Day 20, is given to me to comfort me. He's not just a good friend, a close friend, an intimate friend. He is the person and power of Almighty God living in me so that I am, as Paul says, a temple of the Holy Spirit. This is a wonderful work of the Spirit today, beloved. What circumstance in life can't you face when the Spirit of God brings deep comfort, strength, and courage, and fortitude? This ease and coziness, if you will, is, is for later. After you have suffered a little while, says Peter. Not if you have suffered a little while, but after you have suffered a little while because you will suffer. But after, we may enter into this eternal rest. Until then, God gives me His Spirit to comfort me, to strengthen me, to persevere. How? How does He do that? Well, that's our only comfort. Our second point. Every other comfort that people try to find or enjoy will end in some way. 
food, drink, clothing, vacations, leisure, numbing agents, they never last. But the comfort of the Spirit is unique. It's unique because He points us to the only one who does last, who is forever, who is the same yesterday and today and forever, Jesus Christ. And not only does He point me there, He makes me share in Him, Lord's Day 20. He has also given to me to make me share in Christ. After all, that's what Jesus promised His disciples when He told them about the coming Spirit. John 14, verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in My name, He will teach you all things and will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. That means He's not there to do something new. He's not there to do something different, if you will. He's there to point to Jesus, to bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Jesus repeats that again in John 15, verse 26, in case they missed the point. It's a proof text in Lord's Day 20. But when the Helper comes, Jesus says, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness about Me. We hear it again. He will bear witness about me. That's the Spirit's task. So no wonder the Spirit always seems to be in the background. Some people criticize the Heidelberg Catechism for only giving one Lord's Day to the work of the Spirit. He kind of got short-shifted. Shouldn't the Spirit get much more attention in the New Testament? We don't give Him enough attention here in the Reformed Church. That's the accusation. Maybe there's something to that, that we don't think often enough about the Spirit's work. But we did an exercise in catechism this past year when we got to Lord's Day 20. I had them page through the entire catechism, one Lord's Day at a time, question and answer at a time, and and lift their hand every time they saw the name of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And it was constant, almost every Lord's Day. Not quite every Lord's Day, most Lord's Days. But always then in the background. It was never the Spirit's work or person to be out in the front anyway. He will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He will bear witness about me. So we say with those men who came to Philip, Sir, we wish to see Jesus, and it's the Spirit who's going to make that happen. It's the Spirit who shows me Christ. And that's where I find my only comfort. Not by the Spirit Himself strengthening me all by Himself, encouraging me all by Himself, but by the Spirit drawing me to Christ, binding me to Christ, reminding me of Christ, witnessing to me of Christ. That reminds you of Lord's Day 1, doesn't it? My only comfort in life and death is that in body and soul I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. We have to notice again how complete and total Lord's Day 1 is. Body and soul, life and death. There is no other comfort like it. That's where my only comfort applies. I belong to Jesus Christ and the Spirit Himself brings me there. Then because I'm not my own, I'm not alone. That's pericle, remember? called to one side. Because I'm not my own, I'm never alone. As Paul says in Romans 14 verse 8, for if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So that whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Or how about those comforting words in Romans 8, 38? For I am sure Hear the conviction, the confidence, that comfort, that strength in those words. For I am sure that that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate me from Christ. And that's how the Spirit gives me an only comfort. 
It's unlike any other comfort. And it's what sets Christianity apart from every other religion. Already in the days of Paul, an author by the name of Pliny, a Roman naturalist and a Stoic, he said, I quote, that a supreme being, whatever it be, pays attention to human affairs is a ridiculous notion, end of quote. That's what he figured. Because most, if not all other gods, supreme beings, as Pliny calls them, they are all rather distant from human affairs. They have their own affairs. They have their own realm. If anything, humans are trying to get there, trying to appease them, trying to satisfy them. But to have a supreme being who is interested in human affairs, Pliny says ridiculous. But we say praise God. A supreme being who is interested in human affairs, who pays heed to things happening here, who pays such heed that he now stands at my side because he once stood in my place at Calvary and has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. Who pays such heed that without the will of my Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Who pays such heed that he now, by his Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. That's all from Lord's Day 1. Yes, to live for Him from now on, even if that's in a life full of afflictions and difficulties. How? Well, with this only comfort. An only comfort that comes from the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. 2 Corinthians 1. We're strengthened and fortified and comforted because we know by the grace of the Spirit that nothing is so difficult, so hard, so burdensome, so weighty, so powerful, so challenging, so high, so deep, so nothing in this life that I can't overcome in Christ. I don't need to escape it. I can work through it in the power that He provides with Christ at my side and the Spirit within. Provided I cling to that by true faith. As Lord's Day 20 puts it, He has also given to me to make me by true faith share in Christ. It means this deep and only comfort is also to be a personal comfort. He is given to me. This is to be my confession of faith. We have to notice that personal word, me, again. It's not in every Lord's Day of the Catechism, but it's definitely back here in Lord's Day 20. Christ poured out His Spirit on the church. He's promised to us all. Yes, to you too, boys and girls, here this afternoon. That was God's promise to us at our baptism. When we are baptized into the name of the, Father, the, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit assures us by this sacrament that He will dwell in us. That's the promise. Make us living members of Christ. Your body, that body of flesh and blood, by the promise of the Spirit, will be a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now remember, the Spirit is not some force or some power, only that a little might be in you and a little bit in you and a little bit in you and a little bit in me. But no, the Spirit is God. Equal with the Father and the Son, we confessed in Lord's Day 20. God the Spirit, the Comforter, was poured out on the church and then promised to me personally. When I was baptized... My name was pronounced so clearly and completely and comfortingly from the mouth of the minister. Rulof Yunden Hollander, I baptize you into the name of the Holy Spirit. I was baptized. I received the sign and seal of the covenant as it is true for most of you. 
of the covenant. A covenant, as we were reminded briefly this morning too, that comes with promises and obligations. There is nothing automatic about that covenant. Just because we've been promised the Spirit, the Comforter, doesn't mean He automatically works in you. Think about Judas Iscariot who was there when Jesus promised the Spirit. No, that's why the Catechism says, He is also given to me to make me by true faith share in Christ. By true faith. My faith. Because I can't believe for you. Just as you can't believe for me, you can't even believe for your children. The children of the covenant who have received the promise of the Holy Spirit, they have to come to faith. That's why it's all so important that we as parents instruct our children in these things. That they would grow in understanding and by faith. Grab hold of that grace of God over them. This comfort that we've heard, this deep comfort, this only comfort, is something we must hold on to by faith. Something that I take hold of by faith. The comforted are those who belong to Christ by faith. My only comfort in life and in death is that I belong both in body and soul to my faithful Jesus, Savior Jesus Christ. That is my confession of faith. Yes, my comfort is by faith. It can't be stressed enough. That's why Paul has such strong words of warning sometimes as we read his letters about the way that people treat the Spirit. Ephesians 4 verse 30, he says, And do not grieve the Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve the Spirit. We grieve the Spirit when we continue in sin and sinful behavior. And what does that do to our comfort? For Jesus says too, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The Father and the Son will make their home by the Spirit in those who keep the word. And that includes the words later in that same letter, Ephesians 5, 18, and and do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. That's quite the contrast, isn't it? Paul says, don't be filled with wine or other alcohol for that matter or drugs, but be filled with the Spirit. It's either the one or the other, he's saying. How can you be filled with the Spirit and in Him hold on to this deep and only comfort when you are filled with... It's been said that there's a drinking culture in these parts. Yes, also in the church. And it saddens me to say, I think it's true. It's a sad testimony. Because is there then still room for the filling with the Spirit? And if there's no filling with the Spirit, where is this deep and only comfort? No, those who will be filled with the Spirit, they are living with the Word. Jesus says they submit their lives to the instruction of the Word, and they grab hold of all of that in faith to make this comfort their own. And even as that happens, they come to realize more and more, not I, but the grace of God that is in me. This deep, this only comfort, this personal comfort is mine by the Spirit who makes me share in Christ by true faith. What is your comfort, beloved? Is it this deep, only, personal comfort in Christ by the Spirit? Amen.
This confession of our only comfort is drawn from Scripture, of course, but also from this verse in particular in 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You are not your own, you were bought with a price. This is the confession of Christ's church, as we also express that with the church of all times and all places in the Apostles' Creed. Let's join the voices of God's children through the centuries, through the millennia, and also those in heaven already with Him by reciting or singing together the words of Him too.
Lift up your hearts to the Lord to receive his blessing and then go your ways in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.